you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party Peace and love, party people. It's Tyler Quali to BKMC. You are now in tune to another fantastic episode of the world's best podcast, People's Party. As always, and as usual, I got my lovely and talented and funny and thought provoking co host, Jasmine Lee. How you doing, Jasmine Lee, in the place to be? What up? What up? <laughs> Tyler, you're looking a lot like FAMU right now. Is it colors or what? It's the Why? orange, the green. Oh, man, I just feel like I just look like uh, uh, comfortable. I'm going to pretend you dress for FAMU, though. No, don't do that. It's our homecoming almost. We don't know when this is gonna air. Uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> we focus on the wrong things, Jasmine. We gotta focus on today's guest who is an absolute, absolute legend. Yes. Uh, not just on the West Coast, he's from the West Coast, but a legend in hip hop, uh, one of the greatest working living DJs of all time, um, a producer, a member of the world famous Jurassic Five. He has collaborated with many, many artists like Jay Live, Aloe Black, Kanye, Bumpy Knuckles, just to name a few. He got a whole album with Slim Kid Trey from the far side. As a member of Jurassic Five, he's been a part of uh, their self-titled debut album, Quality Control, Power and Numbers, Feedback. He's made albums on his own. Uh, one of my favorite albums is Broken Sunlight. Um, there's the Blend Crafter series. There's Run for Cover, which is the new joint. This man is very prolific, very busy. I love his Instagram. It's very funny. I enjoy following him online. Um, he has mixtapes like Hands On, Take Me With You. Um, he's dropped the grip of EPs. We can list his accolades all day. And like I said before, he is a living, working legend. And I need to say this as an aspiring DJ myself, one of the best scratchers and selectors and producers out there working. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Uncle New himself, one of the king of the breaks, DJ Newmark, in a place to be. What up, Uncle? Thank you for having me. How you feeling? Chilling, man. Thanks for having me, brother. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Yeah, I man. See you got Good the to green see you uh, in the flesh, as opposed to just online. Yeah, man. I know. Are we talking comedy first? Or are we talking music first? <laughs> oh, so listen. He's so ready. you know that I know about your love for comedy. Oh my God, I adore it. Yes, we're gonna interweave all of these things. You know, Jasmine is a comedian. Yes, I do. Yes, and we're all wearing green, so there's something. Yeah, uh, man. So I was gonna do red today. I'm glad I didn't. No, hey. you wouldn't have been a part of the game. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, so. Wearing green is not the only thing we have in common. Your dad was a college professor for 37 years. Both my parents wow, are college professors. Wow, so is my professors. dad. And so wow. is her dad, that's right. Both my parents are college professors. My dad just retired. So you're like, you, you know, we, we share that. Yeah. Um, being raised by parents who are in education. Yeah. How has that shaped you? Well, my, I just lost my father over the pandemic, so oh, uh, hit me with the heavy stuff Rest first, but I, 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 I appreciate you recognizing him. Mm. Um, you know, he, he was the one who actually got me into music in a way. I, mm. I was chasing kind of like a fallback plan. And, you know, what they mm. say when you have a fallback, you might fall back. Mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> it. that's right. And so I was studying to be an x-ray tech, actually. Wow. And about six months from graduation, I just walked out of class. Wow. And it was because he kept saying to me, like, what are you doing? Like, you know, my dad bought me my first drum set mm -hmm. and I was battling drummers when I was about 10 years old. Okay. In the school auditorium. And when he drum passed, battles. he okay. kept the flyer. So like he had the first, my first flyer. So he's mm -hmm. been my inspiration as to really following my dreams. So, but my mom, strangely enough, was a belly dancer. She was more wow. into arts she ended up being an x-ray tech, which is why she's like, yeah, you need a, a backup plan. You know, the arts is, you know, unstable, mm. all that kind of thing. But right, right, right. my dad ended up being the one that was the catalyst for me moving forward. Okay. Do you still play the drums today? I don't. I'm really ashamed about it, too. But I'm really heavy into, like, finger drumming. And, you know, I kind of went from drums to drum machines. And that kind of sto stole the glory. That and turntables kind of stole the glory from right. the drum set. <laughs> okay. So you're definitely a product of Los Angeles. Yeah. North Hollywood, to be yep. exact, right? Yep. No uh, Talk about growing up there. A lot of house parties, you know. Okay. Um, well, I guess that's a little bit later on. But, you know, I started out in um, uh, a private school in about 
around third grade or so, my mom moved me into this public school because the private school was... The, I jumped on a trampoline, mm-hmm. and they swatted me in front of my entire school with a, with a racquetball paddle. Wow. And my mom came down and raised hell. Then when as I went punishment? to pu- as a punishment. And so when I went to public school, I was like, Mom, I'm having the time of my life. I'm meeting so many different people. This is so cool. I got introduced to this music from this guy, and I just had the time of my life. But um, I, it was a rough time of my life because that's when my mother and my, my step, I won't even call him a stepfather. He's mm-hmm. a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. He was abusing both my mother and myself. And mm-hmm. so I had to learn how to fight a man mm-hmm. like at fourth, fifth grade. Wow. I don't know if it was growing up in North Hollywood that mattered. I was just in my own bubble. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was just kind of trying to fight to keep mom good right. and afloat. But all during that interim, I was introduced to hip hop through my best friend who was in my jazz mm-hmm. band class. Uh, he played bass. I played drums. So he introduced me to UTFO and all these groups. It was the best time ever. Um, yeah, yeah. Man, hip hop is so beautiful. Um, shout out to Russell Peters. I know that's a good friend of yours. <laughs> Russ, yeah, he's a good um, man. But DJing these house parties in LA early in your career, um, around this, around these areas, what I've heard is that you've developed what you call the psychology of DJing. Can yeah. you break that down? I mean, I hear a lot of DJs say you have to read the crowd. You hear that a lot, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure you go. I mean, I know you spin. I've seen mm-hmm. you spin. You, you know, I, I saw you at Boombox. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, you were what they call reading the crowd, right? Right, right, right. But for me, I don't know if it's that I'm not good at reading the crowd or I just think there's another layer to it. I think people want what they don't know they want. Mm-hmm. And I think that's my secret weapon, so to speak. And I attain that from doing house parties. I also learned how to take requests. There's a lot you see online now, like you see really demeaning shit where, you know, DJ has his hand in a woman's face and Mm -hmm. like, I don't take requests. Like that meme went around forever. I'm like, what is this shit? Like if you can take a request and work it into your set where the crowd's already dancing, you're a fly DJ. You can get busy. Yo, you know what's crazy about you saying that? So I just went to, um, I went to South Africa and I went to Zanzibar. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was DJing, DJ parties in every city, every place I went for free, right? Because it's like, I'm right. just, oh, Talib Kweli's in the house. I'm like, yo, can, you know, you want to get on? Can I get on? Like, mm-hmm. and I'm just like, you know, I just want the experience because right. I'm still like, I still see myself an aspiring DJ. Right. Right. So do I. And there's this, in Zanzibar, there's this party called the Full Moon Party mm. that everyone looks forward to. And... They were like, okay, we'll give you like a hotel suite if you DJ this in bottles and right. DJ this party. I'm like, fine, let's go. Yeah. I'm DJing this party. What I, what I learned on this trip, because I downloaded all the like, obviously all the all the African, all the Burner Boy, all the all the hits, right? Right, right. But then I learned about this Ama Piano music and stuff. Yeah, Africa, and I big. got into that and yeah. like really, really focused on that. But what I learned, what I've been learning as a DJ, as, as far as me being Talib Kweli is, that's not what they want from me. It's good if I can do that, yeah. but that's not... They want to hear me play the shit. Your shit. My shit. Not even my songs. But our shirt. Our shit. <laughs> our shit. American yeah. Yeah. hip-hop, funk, soul. You know what I'm saying? I so, learned that in Brazil, the hard way. Right. You go and try yeah. to play for the locals, and yeah. they're like, no, we want you to do your Newmark shit. Yeah. And so by the end of the trip, I had established that, right? Yeah. So I'm like, I had a great set planned for this full moon party. Yeah. And so I'm killing it. Like, I'm doing a good job. And then this girl comes up to me, and she's like, she sings the hook to Juicy by Biggie. She says, do you have this song? You know very well. Wow. And, and you I'm, can I hear know, her in the club. Damn, man. Yeah, I, and I know I, she's not singing yeah. to me. Yeah. I know she's singing Biggie. <laughs> right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? I can just <laughs> tell. me. Yeah, right. You know what I'm yeah. And in my mind, immediately I was like, I don't take requests. But then I'm like, but what if, what if I did play that record? And I'm like... Okay, let me just see if that record even match. And it was the same exact BPMs as mm-hmm. what I was playing. So I was like, yep. oh, she's on point. Later on that night, I was, uh, that's like 96 BPMs. Mm-hmm. Later on that night, I'm like in 125 BPMs now. And I'm like, and this fucking drunk girl comes up to me and she's like, do you have Danza? Such and such and such. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I certainly don't have that record. Because I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know what she's saying. And she's like, no, it's by, um, Don Omar. And I'm like, 
I think I know which record you're talking right, about. Right. And I had the record. And it was the same BPMs of what I was playing. So twice in that night, drunk women came up to me in the, in the crowd. <laughs> Shout out to the drunk women and, in South and Africa. And gave me, this is in, in, in Zanzibar, gave me suggestions that not only worked perfectly, but were the exact BPMs of what I was playing. But you know the problem now, though, right? People are going to come up to us, ask us for requests. Yeah. <laughs> well, Talib said that he loves it. But I th- couldn't believe that happened twice in the night. But how did you feel after? I when felt you, When you worked it in, right? Exactly. I worked it in. So, like, when I was coming up, kind of back to your and, OG and I question. Had, I had my, these are, I wasn't playing off the internet, so these are songs that were in my computer. Beautiful. Like, if you could work, it, I had dudes coming up to me like, play Toddy T now. Right. You know, like, and I'm like, I ain't fucking with this, dude. Like, <laughs> you, you remember that era. Yeah. Like, you know. Okay, let me work it in. Let me work in King T. <laughs> you know this era. Right. Like, you don't fuck around. Like, you, you come at least seven crates King deep. King T, that's a, such a West Coast reference. Yeah. They want to hear that King T record. Hell yeah. yeah. Act a fool, they want to hear that fool, shit, yeah. man. They want to hear that shit. So, like, you have to be good at weaving it in. Yeah, it might take two or three records to get to it, but you got to, like, weave it in. But And look, I'm not making the argument that y- if you don't take requests, you're a whack DJ by any means. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, try it. What would ha- what's the worst that could happen? Do people <laughs> you know? offer you money to play their requests? Mm, uh, I've been I've had money thrown at me when oh, I'm yeah. doing well. That's happened to me too. But like not a stripper from a throw request. Or how what kind of throw? Nah, just like when I'm on a when, when I'm in a pocket, just like okay, yeah, you got it. We, we trust you. We trust you, dough. I need you to come <laughs> to do this party that I do in Austin, in Austin every last Tuesday. Let's do it. Um, I just did the party and a dude from Detroit was like, I want to hear Detroit music, oh, and I'm yeah. like, I'll f- maybe. Yeah. You know, yeah. If I'm working in and he's getting upset. He, like he's getting vis- he's drunk, yeah. he's getting visibly upset. Wow. And he comes and he just throws this hundred dollar bill oh, snap. down on, on top of the com- com- computer. Just keep your money, bro. Yeah, that doesn't get you anywhere. And keep well, t- it keep- does sometimes. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it, it, it doesn't. You think in rent, huh? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, I just had a birthday party at a karaoke bar Uh-oh. and I walked in there and I paid the DJ and I said, Look, it's my birthday. I want to sing and I want to sing a lot. Yeah. And I sang like 10 songs. Yeah, but that's it's respectful. Karaoke karaoke that's, that's really respectful the way you did it. And it's karaoke. Karaoke. Yeah. I played, I played <laughs> a Sada Baby record. Uh-huh. Right. I played a Sada Baby record. And he 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 had, he looked like he had tears in his eyes. He was so happy. Damn. And I was like, I just had to, you know, I just had to pay attention. He just needed some attention. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody wants to feel special in life. You know, that's one yeah. thing we can all take away. Now, you've also said that you know within the first ten minutes of DJing how much you can stretch a crowd. Yeah. I love that phrase, stretch a crowd. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are the indicators of that? And can you break that down? I have like a method when I spin where I have I'll have a crate that I'm working in. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it be a physical crate of 45s or whatever, or Serato, mm-hmm. I get about, I have about like eight to 10 songs. And then like the eighth or 10th song, in that eight to 10 area, towards the end of that first part of the set, I throw like a little doozy at them to see if they can, if they're malleable, if they can move with me. Mm-hmm. If they don't move, I don't move with them either. Mm-hmm. I stick to, like you said, okay, they want to hear you know, classic 90s shit, or um, they want to hear bangers, you know, but mm-hmm. high sweeps and drops or whatever, whatever room I'm in, you know, mm-hmm. that's the reading part, I guess, mm-hmm. right? If they do go for it, I have a whole nother crate ready to mm-hmm. go. Right. It's like, okay, you want to play around? Let's have some fun, you know, like, it just depends on them. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, but, you know. Yeah. I call that my favorites crate. I have, a, oh, you want to go there? I yeah. have a favorites crate. I have one called Feelers. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just Feelers. <laughs> So you were a and R for Correct Records in '96, working with Grav and Kanye. Can you talk to us about Kanye drawing your portrait? Damn, you guys know about the portrait? <laughs> it's people's party. Damn, Damn. <laughs> y'all get busy. Look at, yeah. Jared, look at Jared's smile though. <laughs> he crossed his white man legs too. Like, yeah, <laughs> we know. You got a smile that looks like a logo. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was working at Correct Records, um, doing everything. It felt like I did. I was damn near the janitor. I was doing everything. Um, mm-hmm. College promotion um, helped find talent, if you want to call that A&R cool. I helped DJ for a group called Manish at the time. They're, they, remember, they're yeah. still around, and they have a group called Gumbo now. Okay. Um, or, or Kev is part of Gumbo. But anyway, I found this MC out of Chicago named Grav, short for Gravity. He's really dope and a great person, too, a great human being. Mm-hmm. Um, and he sent me this demo, and I called him on the phone, and immediately we hit it off. I was like, oh, yeah, we're cut from the same cloth, man. I, could, I can talk to you for hours, but I, gotta, I actually got to work. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm going to be working with this cat named Kanye. I'm like, okay, cool. 
So he sent me, I think, one or two joints from him. It might have been even one. And I hit him back. I was like, yo, if you finish the rest of your project with Kanye, we'll put it out. Mm-hmm. All we were trying to be was like a, a West Coast rockist, you know? Right. That's, that's all we were. Re- we just wanted to put Shout out, out to dope it. shit, right. you know, on the West Coast and let people know that the West Coast repped. Mm-hmm. So sure enough, um, he was like, bet, let's do it. And the owner of the company was like, let's do it. Let's go. Worked in, at Power Play Studios in New York and... I was there helping mix and did scratches on a few joints and watched Kanye work in the studio. And this was his first production on any record label. Hmm. And we had a day, I, don't, I know you remember being in the studio where you're like, ah, the mix ain't quite right. And you had to do recalls. Right. But the computers were really janky back then and they would kind of recall your mix. But you're like, damn, my snare's low. What the hell happened? Like, you know, right. shit like that would happen. So we were having problems with the recall that day and Kanye was constantly talking about how he went to art school and he was talking the whole time, you know, and him and Grav was all, were always arguing, which was hysterical to me because <laughs> I didn't have the investment in it. I was like, you know, whatever, we're right. just here to record a record. But they were arguing the whole time and then we get into these big, long debates of who the best, you know, producer was at the time. And, <laughs> no, no, it's Tip. No, it's Pete Rock. No, it, these big, long, I have it on cassette too. Cassette. Yeah, uh, of, <laughs> of the recording. Everything I've learned yeah. this about him. And so he's like, "Yeah, man, man, let me draw you, man. This computer ain't come out. Let me draw your face. I bet you I could draw your face." And he did an ill job, man. He sketched it pretty dope. It looks like a new Mark Kanye blend, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> so he drew his Everybody's own face. face is Kanye he, yeah. <laughs> well, they say that in art, you kind of draw your face when you're drawing faces, though. It's a weird no, thing. It's crazy because you have you seen this meme floating around of Kanye with the white face? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and he signs it, K West. 96 mm-hmm. on it, you know. So Do you still have it? I still have it. I kind of want to NFT it. You should. You should. You, you know, should give all the proceeds with, to Black Lives Matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> and we'll have Candace host it. <laughs> um, at any no, rate, that's an amazing story. I would like to put it out, mm-hmm. you know, with the audio because the conversations and the arguments are hysterical. You like should do it. Finding I mean, over yeah, pieces, pieces of pizza. Like I saw, we're all broke. We're right. like all trying to like just get in where we could fit in and put out dope shit. And one day I'm gonna have this, and you know, right? You oh, know, no, that's dope. You know, it's a great story, man. One of my first hip hop memories is Black Star coming out to perform it. Unity is a Unity event. Oh, bigger yeah, B, Unity. rest bigger in peace. B. Bigger B. Bigger, rest in peace. I feel like that's when I, you know, 1998 was such a huge year in hip hop. Uh, Jurassic dropped big. It's the year that I dropped. Um, now Jurassic formed because you had Unity Committee, yep. right, and Rebels of Rhythm, right. Um, then there's a song Unified Revolution. Yep. Which you're was, the first person who's got the pronunciation correct, by the way. Uh, which like I, I think in about 11 million interviews. Really? Yeah. Revolution. You're the, you're the first person who's got it right. Okay. Well, it's to a my good recollection. Song. But um, tell me how that happened about those two groups and how they linked up. And you met them at Rat Race, right? Yep. So J5 is two groups formed as one plus mm-hmm. me, basically. Okay. So Unity Committee was Charlie Tuna, Mark Seven, and Cut Chemist. Mm-hmm. Rebels Rhythm was Soup, Akil, and a brother that passed away named Shawnee Mac. Mm. Cut Chemist had a beat, the beat for U- a Unified Revolution, and was like, man, I know I'm going to get my group on this, but it would be dope to bring Rebels of Rhythm on it. And so they brought those brothers on it, mm-hmm. and uh, I was in on the session. This was like, we did a deal with Blunt TVT. Well, the guys did. I did not sign Shout that contract. Shout out to Derek Chapman. Yeah, Chappie. <laughs> um, but we had a single before that where I did a New Mark's bonus beats, cut to this elaborate... Um, DJ song called Lesson 4, The Lesson. Yeah, The Lesson's uh, was yeah, good, good Yeah, it's crazy. And so I met them at a rehearsal for this thing called Rat Race where MCs would get up on stage and rhyme over a band. Mm. So the, the band would be playing like a funk groove and then MCs would get up and do their shit. Or mm. the band would learn the MCs' demo tapes. Mm-hmm. So I met them in a rehearsal studio for that night. And it was, yeah, chocolate meets peanut butter. Yeah, History is made. Chocolate meets peanut butter? That old Reese's commercial. Oh, yeah. Um, now, I want to give you <laughs> peanut it's butter? Not, it's not chocolate. a racial well, thing. It's not a racial thing. Peanut butter. <laughs> it might be because <laughs> I blame Helen for 
getting me high, but I think a peanut butter and jelly, but chocolate okay, and peanut yeah. butter do go together in Reese's Pieces yeah. cups. Peanut butter and jelly is actually probably a better way of putting it. Uh, anyway. No, chocolate peanut butter. Chocolate I got, I like, butter. I, I got that perfect. reference. I get yeah. that reference. I mean, right. You and me at a similar age group. I get that reference. Um, I want to give you a chance to give flowers to Soup, Mark, Tuna, yeah. Akil, uh, Cut Chemist, and, yeah. and what they each bring to the table. Well, as a whole, this was the first, col- man, I had been shopping demos. They had been shopping demos <laughs> as their separate groups. Mm-hmm. We all, I was shopping a demo with a cat named Brother Soul, who basically taught me how to dig for records. Like, I don't think he realized he was teaching me how to dig for records, but he'd okay. bring home records like, yo, this is that three times dope sample. I'm like, oh, damn, greatest man alive. Oh, th-, you know, and just flip out. By the time I the met- The Nicholas one. Yeah, the <laughs> Nicholas one. And then by the time I met Cut, mm-hmm. he was kind of digging- in the way Brother Soul was digging, like where he was finding the known samples that were already out, brand Nubian samples, mm-hmm. and recreating De La Soul songs. And I'm like, wait, why are you doing this? He's like, I want to learn how they piece it together. I'm like, that, that's fucking brilliant. So we hit it off right away. Mm-hmm. But the group as a whole, like these were the fir- this was the first time I sat down with MCs that really um, had a respect for 12 inches and rare releases, Chill Rob G things that came out, pr- produced by 45 King. Right. You know, it, Songs that came out, you know, um, um, Mantronics, you know, Just Ice, these kind of releases that we're, I'm like, damn, they, they know the lyrics to this. They, they respect that. Oh, mm-hmm. that was just the 12-inch. You know this, Soup? Damn. Soup was really, really impressed me when I first met him. I was like, damn, you know all this shit, bro? Like, that's, whereas before the MCs were kind of one foot in, one foot out, and the producers were more the nerds about the releases and all that shit. That's the same with me in high tech. That's where we hit it off because I would go to his studio where he would have all these you know, dusty crates of vinyl. Yeah. And I'd be like, yo, this is the shit. He'd be like, yeah. you know that you song? You notice it? I'm yeah. like, yeah, I listened to this just on my spare time. Yeah. And that's, we we started locking in in that way. It was a beautiful time in hip hop too because it's the, the mystique of it all. Like not knowing who knew what and not knowing how they created it with what gear. Like, damn, they, they used a mixer on this? Like what, what kind of mixer did they use? Mm-hmm. Like everything was like unknown mm-hmm. in, in, um, it was just beautiful. It was just all discovery, you know, and just knowing that these cats had uh, the same and sometimes more knowledge than I did on certain releases. I was like, this is dope. Like, w- w- we can do some shit. What was Cold Crush's influence on the Jurassic Five? I- I've always said, I think that out of all the cats in J5, it was really soup that channeled that spirit from Cold Crush and from all the, the greats that paved the way from for all of us. Uh, but soup is infectious. Like once he starts doing a hook, other guys kind of just fell in line, you know? Mm. Um, Sounded like one MC. Yeah. You know, people like kind of go to Charlie because of the baritone voice, but soup was kind of the, in my personal opinion, you know, obviously you get six different views on this if you had the whole group, but he was kind of like the heart of the harmonization in that old school vibe. And so it just kind of clicked. Like, it just I feel like sense. what they were doing, what y'all were doing was so necessary at the time. You know, with Black Star, I relate to it because a lot of the lyrics in Black Star and what we were doing on the Rocket side was about paying tribute yeah. to Rocksteady and paying tribute yeah. to, to the B-Boys and paying tribute to the people who came before us. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and y'all actually did it stylistically. Like, we're going to stylistically pay tribute. It kept a lot of uh, important, you know threads going back and forth with the old school rappers and having Percy P and Big Daddy Kane and people like that on those records. Um, I feel like MCs from our era do that more now, but y'all were doing that as young kids. Yeah. You know, I just think it was, it it just fit. The the shirt fit. Mm -hmm. It just fit. Like, I don't know. Like, you know, it wasn't like a, we got to do this. It was Mm -hmm. just, sometimes you just go with what you know, right? And I think that's really what it was. Yeah. You know, and this is all, MC glory that has nothing to do with me you know and you said my, that's what connected y'all like knowing those records yeah you know it was my job to go oh damn okay I know what kind of beats I normally make but how do I fit into this mold that's how that was my you know psychology going into it now you've spoken a lot about digging and there's digging and then there's digging <laughs> you know there's like a, a subculture mm-hmm. so there's people who might go around go record shopping and yeah. hit places in the states but you're like on your own, financing trips all around the globe to go dig for specific styles of music in specific countries. And there's like a whole like, like almost like secret language of this. Can you take us 
a bit into that subculture of digging? God, I don't even know where to start. Okay, well, I got my ass handed to me once I met Cut because mm -hmm. I thought I was digging for records because Rob One, rest in peace, Rob One, he gave me props and Rob had deep crates. Mm -hmm. It's like, damn, dude, you're like the only cat I know that has like just as deep crates. And then I met Cut and I was like, oh shit, this mm -hmm. dude is wild with it. Mm. So he'd be like, new, we got to wake up early. We got the fair, you know, in um, Pasadena, the record fair. So on the East Coast, they had the Roosevelt and, you know, Pete Rock, everybody, you know, Tip, everybody, you know, Beat Miners, everybody was just cleaning it up. So it wasn't something that Cut and I said, but we felt like we got to catch up, mm. you know, and we hadn't really released J5 yet. We mm -hmm. were, you know, demoing shit. It was like, we got to catch up to these crates because the MIAs are going to be gone. You know, all these records came from like Japan. Somebody brought home the MIAs, but now they're being sold back to Japan or back to other countries. And so we're like, we better grab these. And so when we were going to these, you know, flea markets or to, um, to, to the Pasadena flea market, what I remember the most, I saw him, I saw him like pulling out like $10, $15, 10, $10 $20 on records. And I was, to, back then that was a lot. It's a lot. I remember high tech and them used to complain like they if not they were spending like one two three four five dollars on a record yeah I think more than that I was like yo you robbing me yeah <laughs> when I would like ask he's like dude you don't got time to fuck around right like you don't got time for these dollar bins you can go anywhere for that shit dude right like and he he got mad at me one time because we were in Europe and he was like yo why are you buying an American record in Europe I'm like you're fucking right you're right I'm bugging I should be buying local shit in those territories. And so he set me straight on a lot of things. That's so crazy. Yeah. And, and there was records I had that he was tripping out on. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I had a, the Sapo record that helped him, mm -hmm. like, you know, mend two parts in Lesson 6 when we put out the EP. Like, there was certain, he's like, why are you holding out on me? I'm like, I'm not holding out. I'm just, <laughs> I'm buying records, man. You're so serious. Like, right. This is, but, but, serious, <laughs> but, this is serious yeah, business. Yeah, but, but he whipped me into shape, which I needed, man. Uh -huh. It was a perfect time to do it. He whipped me into shape. I don't think he realized it, but I, you know. He whipped me into shape, and we were trying to catch up to the East Coast. And we caught up all right, like especially mm -hmm. once J5 cracked in Europe first before the States. Mm -hmm. like, And then we were going through the Netherlands, and we started getting in these little pockets. And yeah. like, oh, yo, what's this? The Netherlands, this, Holland, Holland. Yeah, what are these? Oh, they're called library records. What the fuck is a library record? Oh, shit. They're all instrumental, and it's nasty funk. Like, what, this is a dream come true. And then the locals are like, yeah, you guys, you haven't heard about this? Like, nah, gee, what is this? Right. Like, you know, why are you holding out on us? Like, right. you know, so we were just getting... <laughs> Every tour, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, we're late for sound check. We had to go to this spot. There's a private dealer that had X, Y, and Z. You know, it was always mm -hmm. an excuse showing up to sound check a little late or whatever. Right. But um, yeah, I'd say Cut was the biggest influence. And, That's crazy. Yeah. Like, I've heard you say on the 20 podcast, which I enjoyed listening to you on, um, you said that the whole idea of sampling is to create textures. And that really resonated with me because, you know, just for instance, like I'm working with Mad Lib on this new Liberation yeah. record. There's the, the texture king. The texture yeah. king. And there's things that uh, your mans won't let us clear. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that, that, but it's like, nah, fuck that. It's like, I've already tr thought about maybe playing some of this shit over, but it's like, what's the point? It's like, yeah, I could pl have some of this shit played over mm -hmm. and we could clear the sample. Mm -hmm. But is it? Is it the record that we made? Like it's part of part of what the magic of what something like somebody like Madlib does is figure out how to use that texture. I have so many thoughts on this, man. And it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's 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 sad when you can't clear something because of the original artist or publishing holder. Mm -hmm. Because all this shit is is an audio mosaic. Mm -hmm. You're going, oh, this light blue piece works with this dark blue piece. Oh, that's going to be the sunset. Okay. That's all you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're bringing pieces of music together to create a new form of art. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally think this shit should be on a grid. N enough with this. Oh, I recognize my, my hi-hat. That's a hundred grand shit. N enough with that shit. Like mm -hmm. put everything on a grid. Okay. If you're a platinum selling artist, if you sampled one bar equals this much on the publishing side, this much on the master. Just get it on a grid. True. That's, that's a lot Just, of thought that you put into that. I'm, but <laughs> I've been, I, you know, I've got my ass kicked in this shit. Like, yeah. you know, I'm sure as you guys. Like, what it's do you guys just, have to go through to clear a record? Uh, fucking everything. Like, you get our asses handed to us. We get hit by the sample clearance agency. You get hit by the publishing side, you know, and they go, oh, 
yeah, we really want 70% of your, your publishing. And we're like, well, we got four MCs and two DJs. Ain't that a bitch? You know? And then it's like, then Universal or whoever owns the master side of it goes, oh, yeah, we're going to take another four grand, oh, another 15 grand, another 20 grand. You know, you got your manager looking at you like, yo, boys, budget's getting slim. You know, so I'm a replaying guy now all day long, mm. but I make it sound nasty because I collect old preamps and old microphones, and I got my stack of musicians ready to go right now. You, yeah, the musicians you're working with, you're flying around the world to meet the musicians who are yeah. making the stuff that people want to sample. Yeah. A lot of them are local, though, too. It's just getting in where you can fit in, you know, but if it's a thing where you, where you feel like, ah, it's not going to be the same song. Try it anyway. Well, with Mad Lib, I definitely feel that. Yeah. You know, he, well, he, it's a very specific Mad Lib texture. is a very, you know, he's, yeah. he might be the, you know, the, the exception to the rule. Um, I've, I've played a lot of things over in my career. Yeah. yeah on my first, on Eardrum, Mad Lib produced three or four things on there. Yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't ready to accept the Mad Lib style of, well, here's the beat. You just rap to it. I was like, well, no, no, no. Clearly we have to. Yeah. So we had like a fire department, Eric Krasno and these guys and, and, and Deitch and these guys came in and played on top of it. So there's songs on Eardrum, yeah. uh, Everything Man, the song with Nora Jones. Some songs, new day. some songs have so much character from the sample that it's just like, fuck it. Just I feel like we did a good it. job with these yeah. records on Eardrum though. Yeah. But my intentionality is different with Liberation. Yeah. That's a collaboration between me and Mad Lib as opposed to a song on a Talib Kweli record. Right, right, right. You do sample packs now. Yeah. Tell me about that because I've just now been getting into picking beats that come from the sample packs. Sample packs have, have been like a way for me to strengthen my chops as a producer. Mm -hmm. That too is something I've seen online where I've seen other producers bashing on sample packs. I'm like, I think they might be looking at it from the purchaser side. Like, oh, you're picking up somebody else's sounds. And I look at the equation like, no, I'm trying to be a better producer. That's why I'm putting out the pack. So my point is, if you focus on one sound, you're hitting a kick drum over and over and over again. Oh, no, I got way too much 250 in that. Let me take down that, that, that frequency. Okay, oh, damn. You know, your family's going crazy hearing the kick drum through the studio, through the walls. Like, why are you repeating the same sound? What's going, you know, it's mm -hmm. not fun making packs. Like, it's not like, oh, I got the chorus. Now I'm going to work on to the, you know, the, the verse part or whatever. It's really focused production. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really why I wanted to put out a pack. But Ableton wanted to collaborate with me on it. So I have a new pack coming actually called uh, Create Adventure. That's going to be, I think, <laughs> November. Create coming. Adventure. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I like to do it because it really focuses me as a producer. Like it sharpens me up. And it builds my library, obviously, you know. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can give some 13-year-old kid that's like, I don't understand any of this shit, like, a chance to, that's like, dope. get busy and not have to fucking go through the woes that we just talked about with sample clearance that's or dope. lack thereof. <laughs> that's dope. What was it like putting together the Quality Control album and single? Yeah, wow. Um, so the EP was before that, and I think we were, like, selling, I think we had hit, like, 150,000 units by ourselves or something like that. And, and that was a shitload of records back in the day. It's a lot. It's a shitload of records. It's a lot now. You know? Like, yeah. it's a lot now. It's just, it, we couldn't believe it. Um, we were excited. So going into the, a deal with Interscope Records was... There was a lot of debate going into it. I remember I was like, let's stay independent. You remember the independent thing, the keep it real, mm -hmm. don't, don't sell out, don't sign to a label. That whole thing was going on at the time. So mm -hmm. I was gung-ho that, and I was like, let's stay indie. And we had like a, a really heated and constructive meeting. I remember this. And Soup was like, how are we going to get a dope video new? And I was like, you're right. Let's, let's sign. Mm -hmm. and, and like Soup, again, uh, for the win, he came in and commandeered that conversation. I was like, okay. But the actual recording process, um, for me personally, I felt lost. Mm -hmm. If I'm being completely honest, I hadn't found my sound with the group yet. Uh, I had some shit on that album that I really am proud of. Don't get me wrong. Like I loved what I did for Monkey Bars, even though I wanted that to be an instrumental, but cut leaked it to the group. Um, swing set is one of my most proud moments as a producer. However, I hadn't found my groove with them, like where we connected, like uh, my voice. It, cut had already had his groove from the EP. He was already like jogging. You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, how am I fitting into this crew production wise? They'll probably tell a different story than I would, but this is how I felt. Mm -hmm. The other thing was the red light in the background, the fucking, oh, 
okay, your time's up, but we got to finish today's session. That shit bothered me because uh. before that, we were in Cut Studio recording on an 8-track. So the EP was done on an 8-track. And we had time to stop and go, hey, what would happen if we would mute this vocal? Why would you mute a vocal? Like, you're in the middle of his verse. Why would you do that? You know, Mark 7 pissed off. Why'd you mute my vocal? It needs a break right here. We were more, I was in ex, like more playful experimental mode, mm-hmm. which is, in my humble opinion, what, where you need to be if you step into any studio. You need to be in a truthful and mm-hmm. playful mood. And I was in that mode at Cuts and not so much when we were recording Quality Control. It was the album after that I was like, let's get it. That's when I was open. Quality Control felt controlled to me. <laughs> yeah. What um, about now with the mobile studios and the fact that you could just re- really record from anywhere, essentially with an iPhone at this point? Yeah. Does it feel liberating? I, I have... Because I know I've heard you say that you like being in the studio. That's like a safe space for you. But the studio could be anywhere at this point, right? Yeah. So, yes, to answer your question, that is cool as mobile. I, I'm, I'm the kind of person that I have to walk in the studio and touch and feel the mm. keys every day, no matter if I'm creating whack shit, dope mm-hmm. shit doing a rudiment on the turntables, whatever. I just have to touch and feel it to feel human. Um, to answer your question, yeah, it's dope that it's portable when I'm fucking alone in you know, a hotel, right. and I'm like, well, don't, don't, how am I going to kill time? I, I love that. Um, you mentioned swing set. That's a favorite of mine. You show off your jazz knowledge, and um, it's a very deliberate record that connects hip-hop with bygone eras. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of... a. Jungle Brothers' Days to Come. Oh, yeah. Wow. Right? What a record. Damn. And um, Jazz Thing by Gangstar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so can you explore with us a little bit your relationship with jazz music? Yeah. So I can't remember the which one was which, but I showed up, I think, to, to the studio with a crate of swing records. It's mm-hmm. specifically a swing record, really. And I think Cut said, I want to make a swing beat, or I said, I want to make a swing beat, and, and I don't know what... At any, at any rate, we were on the same level, you know, uh, the Libra Gemini thing just fucking mm-hmm. always yes. clicks. We just got to work on it and worked on it for like three months, mm-hmm. which is a long time for back then. It was a long time period, but we just kind of worked on it a little bit as we were working with the MCs, like, okay, they need to write more. Let's get back to swing set. Mm-hmm. It was one of those. So it was just so much fun. Like, oh, this piece is perfect. And it's like all samples. And I got to debut my, my rubber band on the turntable thing on the song. And it just all this cool creative shit that really only Cut and I would really care about. Or you thought that only you would care about? We didn't know what was going to happen, mm-hmm. but it had a late detonation. Mm-hmm. It turned out like six or seven years, people were like, oh, I want to, I made this video for the song. Mm-hmm. And like, or people would come up to us after shows and talk about it. But when we put it out, it was crickets. Right, right. Straight crickets. Like, right. Nothing. On freedom. Oh, yeah, freedom, yeah. Why was it important to speak on that at the time? There was a lot going on. At the time, like there always is. Um, but yeah. I think the spark to the lyric ideas was from the original 7-inch that I sampled from Julius Brockington. And he's talking heavy shit in there. And like, you know, one of the things, kind of getting back to the sample conversation, one of the things what we never wanted to do was grab a piece of music from the 60s and 70s when they were going through hell and high water and do something like light in the ass or not important or halfway meeting the mark artistically. So I think the MCs wanted to expand on that. And then I think the hook came first in that, or I forget how that was laid out, but it was just more of an expansion of the original sample um, from my recollection. It's crazy that the same things keep happening over and over. Like, I would love a new struggle. Yeah, well, we we got them. (laughs) (laughs) Now, one of my favorite J5 records is What's Golden. Uh, I feel like I was on the road with y'all when that record was cracking. That's my favorite. Take me back behind your favorite. So th- now we're in the stage where I'm like comfortable. Mm-hmm. I know what the group can do, not only in the studio, but definitely on the road. We did more shows than we ever did in a studio. That's for damn sure. I think the, I think the group was, was kind of giving it to me like, yo, we need more beats. Mm-hmm. That was a common theme. I was like, yo, and we need better beats. I was like, shit, I just got chin checked. Like, okay. And so I went to work on that album and mm. played the beat. And they started working in a way that is, I think, personally, if I could be so bold, I think it's essential. And I, th- I always think you should start with the hook first and work your trickle down to the verses. Mm. I, the old school cast, like, you know, Quincy and Steely Dan and all these cats from the OGs, they are like, 
What do you want to make a song about? Oh, Peg. Oh, that's a funny name for a woman. Peg. Okay, we got the name. Now what's the hook? They start from the from the hook, very yeah. top of the triangle. They're at they're right here and they work down and it's there's formulas to making hits. And the guys started kind of mumbling over the melodic part that I made for that mm. beat. And I was like, oh yeah, we're good. Keep doing that shit. If we do this on more songs, we'll, we'll be crushing it. Like, and things came together. God bless Chuck D for letting us clear that sample. One of the greatest humans I've interacted with in this industry. Stage of rage and I'm yeah. rolling. And just kind of getting together, yeah. Yeah, man. That's and we were recording it in my crib. I had just bought a house in my studio. The mm -hmm. red light wasn't on. <laughs> I was comfortable. That's right. what I was kind of trying to get to. But Right. Yeah. Now, going from that into the feedback album, Yeah. Um, I've heard it said that creative differences led to the group's breakup around the time of this album, right? Yeah. And so when you listen to this album, one of the first songs out the gate is Radio, where you guys are directly addressing radio play or lack thereof. Yeah. Um, same with uh, Where You're At. There's, there's more uh, addressing the lack of radio play and, and how that made the guys feel. Um, do you think the pressure being a bigger group, a uh, group that's on a label, uh, pressure to be on the radio had an effect on that, on the breakup? No. Okay. Me personally, I don't think it was radio that did it. There was a lot of things. I'm sure you've gone through this as well as an mm -hmm. artist where all the things that bring you together with an artist, whether it be, you know, Yasin or whoever you're working with, all the things that bring you together, that many things pull you apart. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling like we were starting not to have as many things to say. We're running mm -hmm. out of things to say. And I don't mean that just lyrically. I mean what kind of beat do I make for these guys now? Mm. You know, like, what is there to say? And if you're not saying something in art, what are you doing? Like, I kind of felt like that was always underlining, the underlining tug. But for me, you know, I've always had two things. It's like, if I'm going to work with an artist, A, I have to hear it. Mm -hmm. And B, I have to feel the heartbeat. Mm. And both of those were getting really gray. Mm. And I needed to hear the five heartbeats. Right. I wasn't hearing them. It, it, build it up, build it. I still got yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, creative differences. Right. Uh, there's also like, you know, there was also a search for like, you know, damn. There was this thing of like, how come black folks ain't coming to our show? And I remember thinking like, have you put on like the, the Chronic tour VHS? I mean like. <laughs> you know, the Up and Smoke DVD? Yeah, it's like, it's a different time. Like, right. yeah, when we were 13, we'd go see Run DMC. It was Definitely black folks in the crowd, but times changed, and mm -hmm. I, I I just always thought it was like a touchy topic. It's touchy for me to even bring it up to like try to reach out to a certain fan base. It's really really delicate. That's interesting you say that because in listening to that album, what you're expressing here was being expressed lyrically. Yes, like these guys were talking they were about talking these about things. That. Yeah, so and maybe it isn't the delicate. The decision <laughs> of J Five to the fact that these guys grew up. In poverty, you know, yeah. most of them and grew up in areas of gang activity, Definitely. but they're not associated with these things. Definitely. And what that's like for them as men, as it's, black men. It, and look, I can't speak on it because mm -hmm. I'm not a black man, mm -hmm. but I felt their pain. And I, at the same time, I was like, damn, this is, this is like tightrope walking. Cut had already left the group, which is mm -hmm. another, you know, a leg from the table left. You know, and the whole chemistry changes mm -hmm. when when a member leaves. Doesn't matter if it's the weakest player or the dopest mm -hmm. MC, whatever. It, it don't matter. It the chemistry the chemistry structure completely changes. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that, you know. And then we would meet with you know Scott Storch, one of my favorite producers. But I was like, this don't sound like Scott Storch meets J Five though. And then we meet with Salam Remy, another one of my favorites. I was like, but this don't sound like Salam meets J Five. You know, that was the radio beat. It sounds like, it a, sounds like a beefed up. Old school joint, which was dope, but we needed to kind of get to an, the next level, the next thing. And then, like, I had the weirdest meeting. I went over to Pandora, mm -hmm. and they're like, yo, New, what do you think the most streamed J5 song is? I already know what it is, because it's my favorite one on that album. And I'm like, I start, they're talking, like, our whole career. So I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, so first thing I said was, what's golden? Then I, they're like, nope. I was like, okay, Concrete Score? I'm like, nope. I'm like... So now I'm like kind of perplexed. I'm like, so I started naming like probably four or five other ones. They're like, Canto de Asana. I'm like, what? Yeah, that's my favorite Newmark beat. That's the one, bro. That's the, I play that in my DJ set. And so that, I get it. And that was on the album where the guys were reaching out to other 
producers mm -hmm. trying to, and, and I'm all for that. Like I, I really wanted them to reach out to other producers, but for whatever reason, we, we just couldn't find that chemistry with mm -hmm. those producers or there was chemistry there, but it didn't hit the end mark goal. I think, you know, right. I took the scenic route to your question, but no, I like, you it. know, I like it. What led to um, J5 becoming such a big touring group? Getting our ass kicked on the road with groups we probably should have no idea, no business playing with, like opening up for Fiona Apple. I was like, why? Why are we doing this? Like, That's where you get the white fans from. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're onto something there, but um, ah, I want to remember the name of the tour. Anyways, we, we did one tour where they don't name, they don't list when the artists are going on. It's during mm -hmm. the day. Um, and they switched our set with Green Day. They switched Green Day set with our set. So Green Day was supposed to go on at like 4 p.m., but they didn't tell the audience and they put us on instead. And when I talk about raining bottles on us. Oh, my gosh. This was, for me, the most important show for J5. Mm. It rained. Somebody threw a bottle of orange soda, half Ooh, orange soda, orange half soda. sand at my turntables pre serato mm. But I was also bringing an SP-1200 on the road. So mm -hmm. the bottle hit my needle, scratched our show vinyl, and I immediately jumped on the SP-1200 Play to beat the same tempo of the song. The MCs rhyme through it. I'm seeing dudes getting hit in the face with bottles, and they're they're just pushing forward. They're not doing the fuck. There was at that time there was the like um, whole thing of like MCs walking off stage, fuck you, and like you know that whole back and forth with the crowd, and they're throwing more shit. The MCs just push through. We mm. push through all the way, and then the crowd just went crazy for us. Like it was insane. Mm. And I was like, yo, this was the most pivotal show of our career after that we nobody was fucking with us wow no but i mean like we were on um smoking grooves tour tore that shit down like and some epic shows there was like if i could be so bold to say there was not a lot of groups that could fuck with our late our live show we were in there to murder shit and we did mm. where did the band feel most at home You'd get a different answer from every MC, every every person in the group. Mm -hmm. I personally loved being in Europe. I loved being in the UK, uh, in Australia. Australia. Australia, Mike. <laughs> Taliba! <laughs> My gosh, the father's there. <laughs> <laughs> the father's there. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm a father. That's because he cares. I care. All accents matter. Um, All accents <laughs> matter. Um, one of the liveest parts of the J5 live show was when you started DJing with these music blocks oh, toys yeah. which I used to really enjoy seeing you do that um, when did you start experimenting with those toys and, and what even is that when Cut left the group I was mm -hmm. like I gotta fill more time for our DJ solo my ex-girlfriend at the time uh, introduced me to this toy mm -hmm. she's like yo check this shit out and I pr it's like a toy with six cubes on it all different colors different shapes on each side of the cube and she's like press this shit i press it i'm like yo that's a fucking that's pretty dope it was one bar of music that sounded like an sp 1200 it had like that 12 bit grain to it right like this is fucking ill and I turned it over played an, another bar same tempo i was like oh shit and then she's like and it comes with different cartridges so that was the jazz one this is african and i'm like y say what <laughs> so i bought six of them and i hooked it up with my mixer in the middle and practice on them like I had just bought my first set of 1200 turntables and I was like yo this is going into my DJ set and I just from that the toy set was born basically um, but that was the catalyst to a lot of ideas in my head I'm like damn if they're making this toy what else are they making like what's out here this sounds like a new level of genius for you to even think to do that I've always said I've never produced a record in my life. I've never DJed an event in my life. It's the music. Music has always shown me the way. Mm -hmm. and before it was music, it was my dad. Like, what are you doing? Why are you in X-ray school? It was. I was always something going. Here's the path. I just cleared the the rubble out of the way. Once you walk down the path, right. And for that, the toy was doing all the heavy lifting. I was like, well, all I gotta do is walk down the path. So you ended up working with um, MF Doom, uh, Melody. Um and uh, Saliva, right? Yeah. I didn't do Saliva, but I okay. released Saliva on a mixtape. That was uh, RJD2. That, okay. that's, that's an insane, okay, okay, okay. insane uh, work there, by the way. But, um, well, what's, tell me about working with Dude, Superfilm. man, the 
that one hurts, man. It's like Dilla and Doom hurt. Dilla, Doom, and Biz hurt so much when they pass. I was like, God damn. Like, uh, you start to think that the good ones are picked, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I bonded with him over comic book shit. Mm-hmm. And I was surprised he would even take my request because it was really a remix that we were doing for the Blank Crafters project. I was like, mm-hmm. man, it just, you know, it's an instrumental project, but... I feel like we're doing this shit in our pajamas. We're not, we're kind of phoning it in, man. Like we're not like, let's, let's do something cool with a remix. And he picked up right away. And I always thought his manager was him and they were fucking with me on the phone. <laughs> Grim, oh, MF Grim. I, Grim, yeah. I, I, they have the same voice. Am I bugging? Like I'm, I'm very audio. So like, I was like, he's fucking with me. He doesn't have a manager and he's, he's like talking business with me on the phone. <laughs> I went through this psychosis of like. Well, no, so there's a rapper named MF Grim who was, in the new music seminar. This was a guy who was down with Doom early in early days. Same dude? No, but then there was Ben Grimm. Grimm, my bad, Ben Grimm. Right, there was yeah. Ben Grimm, yeah. who, I, who I knew and met and okay. toured with, who played the role of the manager. Yeah. And I might be correct or incorrect about this, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that Ben Grimm went out with that mask every once in a while. <laughs> Oh shit! Now you're bugging me out I, even more. Like I'm okay. feeling like Ben Grimm went out with the Doom mask and did some of them shows. I remember hearing those stories. Yeah. I didn't know it was him. Oh my god, Ben! I need to buy you a drink. You, <laughs> damn, ben, that was ill, bro. Like, um, but it, it might have also like been Doom. Doom pretending to be Ben Grimm. That's also <laughs> possible. This is this is why I love Doom. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is what art should be. Confused. I hate. Yes. I stopped about. About 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. trying to figure out what DJs are doing on stage Mm -hmm. or what a producer did because I found uh, myself being in this sense of wonderment like I was at 13. Right. And that was my my favorite part of the music industry is being a fan. Right. And I lost sight of it. You know, you you go a little crazy with this shit, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that that if I hope they were trying to dupe me. (laughs) Right. Like, right. That would be a Ben. Phone me, email right. me or something, because I would love if they were trying to dupe me. But either way, we got the song done. I don't give a shit. But right. I was like, <laughs> I'm like, want to say this is doom, right? Like, at any rate, he knocked it out. Knocked it split, out. And I'm surprised he took the call. Shout out well, to Well, here's a real flip. Isn't Ben Grimm is the name of the human name of the thing. That's right. right. And right. the thing is the enemy of Dr. Doom. Right. That's right. Okay, so it's, there's a comic book tying into it all too, right? Oh, That's yeah, right. you know, we haven't Put even Put a started... mic on that man. Yeah, I mean... No, please don't. <laughs> 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 Steve, Steve did a white people translation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now you gotta do it with your dance, Steve. <laughs> he has his green on doing. in his shoes. He's ready to come. Yeah, I heard you did a set. Shit. Now I'm gonna be thinking about this all night. Listen, I, I heard if this was... that you did a DJ Damn. set recently in which you were DJing specifically to the dance moves that Ramucci was doing. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is completely true. Okay. Yeah, and I made sure it was ultra stiff. <laughs> yeah. You know, talk to speech on the computer for the hearing impaired? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I played my cover dance. of uh, Break Your Neck by Busta Rhymes. Right, off talk to speech. Because I saw him dancing, them. I'm like, wait, I got the joint for you, hold up. <laughs> and I threw it in, and he just started doing his tippy toe dance, that, that shit. <laughs> And it was on and cracking. <laughs> tippy, t- tippy yeah. toe. That's hilarious. Yeah. One of my favorite projects from you is this Broken Sunlight. Oh, man. Um, this song, uh, Oye... Oye... Uh, Indebore. Yeah, Oye yeah. Indebore. Yeah. This song, I gotta be honest with you, this is the first song that I heard. Did I talk to you about this song? We talked about it somewhere, and I was like, dumbfounded that you even heard the song yeah because maybe at your crib i went to your crib once but something about this song is like i i kind of knew that you were involved in the production of jurassic 5 i wasn't really familiar with your your solo stuff because jurassic 5 to me was always a a unit i never looked at it as i never thought about who did the beats yeah you know i was just like okay it's just a bunch of guys and they come up with this music yep but hearing that i'm like oh no i really really enjoy newmark as a producer that song that song made me feel that way uh lost professor on when you sleep that sounds like a, a dream come true for a producer like you to do a record like I that. I was outside of my body when that, he, because he actually came to the studio and I had the most beautiful bottle of red wine that night. It was a mm-hmm. perfect bottle. It was just me, my engineer, and Lars. Good nose on it. It was good, everything on it. And, <laughs> and I was just like, 
I was so excited. I was pounding on the glass between the vocal booth mm-hmm. and the in the main room, and I was shaking my engineer like you hearing this shit like it yeah just i can so imagine hearing it knowing <sighs> what who, what large professor would should represent to a producer like you the stories you just told about digging Man. and the things he says what he says on the record he it's says so Ill. you sound like you from queens yeah he says end. you sound like yeah. you from where i'm from do his word play on that shit if it, it oh man like this dude is an ill MC. I mean, I know a yeah. lot of people know Large Professor's ill MC, but he is really underestimated, man. Like, he's in my, we go, who's underestimated? I put him there. I put Chill Rob G. There's a lot mm-hmm. of, like, people that, like, do like that with. And, man, LP what's, is ridiculous. What's the name of that first Chill Rob G song that hit, that hit before Power? Uh, well, I like Let uh, Let Me Flow and um, Ride the Rhythm. Ride the Rhythm is the one I'm thinking of, maybe. Because when you said it, it's been killing me since you said Show Rob G. Yeah. There was a record that came out before the Power record. Yeah. So what's what's the story behind that? What's the what's the official story behind that Power record? So it's, it, it's 45 King, right? Yeah. I and Show Rob G's single, right? Yeah. And then Snap from Germany just did the song over. Yeah, but, and, and that became the biggest shit. And I mean, it blew I, up. Yeah, and I get how that happens. But and the guy in Snap is rapping yeah. like he's Chill Rob G. Yeah, it's all kinds of fucking weird shit going on. But Chill Rob has one of the illest voices. Mm-hmm. Like, I put them, put him near, like, Chuck and Charlie and all these dudes mm-hmm. with baritones. Like, there's a lack of baritones in our world now. You know, like, yeah. they're, they're, they're hard to come by. So, like... But he ha- he was spitting lyrics, you know, so shouts to Chill Rob, man. Yeah, definitely. Um, on uh, your re-edit of Ernie Hines, Our Generation is really dope. Pete Rock obviously flipped that yeah. almost to perfection. Yeah. Um, how big of an influence is Pete Rock on you? Huge. I mean, Pete, he's the remix king. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't, you can't, he's the remix king, he's the filter king. He's the taking chance with uh, jazz and moody Horns. melancholy shit king. He... He he jumped off the ledge, man. Mm-hmm. He 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 and and he was ahead of the pack. Mm-hmm. That's he had all the right pieces, and he was digging like crazy. Yeah, you know. Um, I think once that, well, once Reminisce hit, it was game over, and that shut him down. Remix, and then the series of remixes, mm-hmm. one after another after another, you were like, okay, like the bar is. Yeah, raised. I think Reminisce is the. Uh, that's the one. That's the perfect. Yeah. That's the one. If aliens came down from Earth yeah. and said, "What is a what is a hip hop sample?" Yeah, I'd play them reminisce. Mm-hmm. It's a perfect sample. Yeah, yeah, it's beautifully done. So when you first sat down, you were like, "Are we gonna talk about my love of comedy?" So now oh. here, <laughs> we are we here now, well, are we at the comedy part of the show? We're now? at the comedy portion of our show. Okay. For the first question, uh, what was it like working with Lonely? I'm just kidding. What was it like working with Lonely Island? Those dudes are ill. Those those are the quickest working artists I've ever worked with in the mm-hmm. studio. Well, um, Method Man is a close second, but those dudes are crazy because they are like, okay, what are we gonna do a song about? How, how about punching somebody in the jeans? That's their, <laughs> that's their comedy, you right. know. And then they just start writing like. They do they pick it, a style of music first and then start writing? They hit me. They do so many different. Okay, styles. so they hit me up. They're like, "New, we want beats for a comedy album." And I'm like, "Oh, so the first thing that comes to my head because I I collect whack shit. I really love whack shit. Okay, like <laughs> I collect whack demos and like <laughs> like, like, like who's on your list of whack demos? <laughs> so no, no, not any nobody you've heard like okay. like, like students who went to CSUN. Okay, like I'm <laughs> ill. Like like the that, guys on Hollywood Boulevard. So, like like show. students who went to CSUN for a music class and got a C on a song. Ah. <laughs> that's the kind of shit I'm into. Wow, I didn't, um, okay. I, I didn't like know you could really get stupid, nonsensical humor because life is so logical and it just bogs you down, life you know? Life is logical. It, it, right. Well, what you know what I mean. Like it tries I think you got, to be, you got pushback from two different people. <laughs> I know, man. I'm getting, I'm getting heckled over here. Uh, I'm not on stage. I'm not a stand-up. Uh, but any, at any rate, how do we get on this shit? Oh, Lonely Island. The first thought that came to my mind is like, they want whack beats. Because I went so far down this rabbit hole with whack shit. And I was like, they're like, no, man, give us that ill shit. Like, give us some dope, like, hard-hitting shit. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, what are you... <laughs> And then they put out, like, I'm on a boat, mimicking all the MCs or all mm-hmm. the rappers that are talking about being on a yacht and shit. I was like, oh, you guys are ill. Right. You guys are fucking funny. T-Pain, right? And they were writing quick as hell in the studio and knocking out their takes quick. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, you guys definitely worked on SNL. 
You're used to that barrage of like yeah, warfare I, coming out every angle, you know. I became friends with Jorma. Oh, yo, Jorma is the, is the man. And yeah, he yeah. put me in touch with some Ghanaian musicians that I did a feature <laughs> with. Like, he's like, I listened to he hit Ghanaian me up about hip-hop. This. Yeah, he hit me up about this recently. About the Ghanaian yeah, hip-hop? Yeah, the same dude. Oh, the same, that's the yeah. shit. That's like, he loved this fucking guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that pop star movie. Hysterical. Oh, so these fucking guys, they it's go. amazing. They go, new, send us a, a you know, a shot, a, a, a face shot, you know. We're going to use it in our new movie. And I was like, for what? You know, no answer back. I'm like, right. fuck it, whatever. I sent it over, and they make me a dolphin hunter in the opening scene. <laughs> like, we're, we're, I'm spearing a dolphin. Like, yeah, and our DJ, they call me DJ Francis. Our DJ Francis is over there hunting dolphins in Japan. What a dick. What a and dick. then they go to the next scene. <laughs> what a dick. I'm like, you guys are assholes, but I love you. Right, so I'm going to tell you what's crazy. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what's crazy about you saying that yeah. is because <laughs> I, brought, I brought this movie up because I watch this movie all the time. Hilarious. You do? Oh, I shit. Love this oh, okay, movie. damn. I'm surprised you even. I watched this movie. It's, all the time. it's fucking And I it's was fucking today hysterical. years old when I learned that that was you spearing them dolphins, you fucking dick. Dude, you and fucking they, put, they put this, they put this. Oh, the comedic timing. Yeah, yeah, they put this huge wig on my head. They superimposed me on this like canoe with huge waves That's you. behind I see me. It. No, I see it Fucking now. spearing a dolphin. I'm like, I love dolphins. Like, I just went to Tulum. I love so them. So do you know the Style Boys dance? No, I mean, I, I, it's vague, man. I mean, style boys. Yeah, uh, but, but, um, I'm sure the guy in the back with the blue shirt on does. With right, the fucking, Steve? Um, you, oh, like, Steve knows the style boys. Dance. <laughs> you guys, Are you gonna come and do the tiptoe dance? No, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, shy Steve. I'm kind of digging that. Um, uh, you didn't say where your love of for them or comedy came for from. For comedy. Okay, so, fuck, I've always been a, a zag nut, man. I've always been nuts. My mom always like, you should have been a comedian. I'm like, mom, I don't got bars There's like that. There's still time. Uh, no, there really ain't. Not for me. <laughs> I, I, I do good in, like, this kind of setting where there's people talking and uh -huh. you can bounce off people. I'm, I'm good, but one man on the mic, hell no. I got into, I think Robin Williams was the first. I was like, this dude is crazy. Yeah. Like, he's just jumping no. off the ledge every second you can get a chance. And then when I started digging for records, I had all the Richard Pryor records. So I was like, oh, this dude is unstoppable. Today it's Chappelle. There's bar none. Mm -hmm. He's the goat. Um, that Sticks and Stones. I was, I was like, dude, you just, I had to just keep watching it over and over. It was like that good. Yeah, um, I heard you talking about that on another podcast. And what you were talking about, you were talking about how you see comedians do things that you do as a DJ. Absolutely. And what you were talking about is that timing. Yeah. You can put Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, the, the the goats. You can put their sets once they master them. Once they get to the sticks and stones that you see, you can put it to a metronome. Dude. And it's like dude, dude, and they're hitting every mark. It's a and it's set up, set up, punchline, set up, set up, punchline. And sometimes they take chances. And there's so many similarities. Mm -hmm. There's like, I've seen I've seen stand ups do this like. I don't want to call it a rule because there's no rules in any of this, but it's like almost like the rule of two or the rule of three. Well, they'll hit you with one joke, the crowd laughs, and they hit him with another one right after it. It's like a one-two punch, mm -hmm. almost like watching boxing. Mm -hmm. I was like, yo, I'm biting that shit. I'm, I'm right. going to do th Callbacks. Yeah. Th this is how I get my inspiration, like mm -hmm. through different forms of art or nature or, you know, hearing, you know, woodpeckers and crazy shit. Like this is how I kind of like zone into my world. But seeing like I've seen... Uh, stand-ups do like one, two, three, and then they change the subject, and then they go back to the joke. And I'm like, you murdered that. That's that, a callback. That's how you do it. The, is that what it's called? Callback? Call callback, yeah. Okay, callback. That is the shit. It is. <laughs> that is, it is the it is. absolute shit. I love a good callback. And back. I love when a, a comedian just drives a joke into the ground over and over. It just keeps going down like, oh, my God, this is an endless pit. So, like, all three of those, I've – definitely found myself doing as a DJ. And I'm like, oh, this is about timing. And when they don't have blunders on the mic, they don't like stutter or mess up a word. It's everything. Just like if I don't stutter and fuck up a scratch when mm -hmm. I throw in a record or it's offbeat, it's like, it's all like very similar. And it's very um, daring being on the mic, just like it is just being in front of people, you know, behind turntables. Yeah, so. yes, indeed. Um, now you mentioned the working with Method Man. This is somebody who is one of the best ever and keeps getting better. You work with him on Zodiac Killer, which is an amazing record. But um, th does that have something to do with the Zodiac thing you were doing for people's birthdays? Yes. So I did, um, for people who don't know, it, it was um, a series of DJ mixes that I did on my social media where I mix all my favorite or influential artists uh, in their Zodiac sign. So mm -hmm. if I'm in Libra, I'm handling you. I'm doing, you know, my man Cut. I'm doing, you know, a bunch of people in Libra and I'm 
using vinyl to play parts from records that are memorable to me. And so each month I go to the next Zodiac sign. Mm -hmm. At any rate, I did two seasons of it. I had 24 mixes, and it was starting to, to do really well online. And so People love Zodiac. Yeah, it was just a weird thing. Um, and it, it completely challenged me as a DJ. I was no longer like, I don't really like compare myself to anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I just do what I have to do. But I was really boxing in the mirror. It's like, can you get... I mean, it's some vinyl nerd shit, bro. That's like some yeah. super like, that's for other people collect vinyl. That's, you're showing off. Yeah. But the, the, re the real... The uh, real, there's nothing wrong with that in this yeah. world. But you the know, backbone like, to it was really to pay homage to as many yeah. artists as I could in a birthday style. And if I had, a, like, if I had, like, there was one with Alchemist and the original sample was the same. I think he's Scorpio, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And then there was another member of the MC. There was another person on the mic that was a Scorpio. So I had like a three for one. I was like, oh, the samples, you know, you know, uh, Scorpio, Al is, and then the, the other MC on the track is. So I, I'm like, those, I'm, that's when I'm like, yeah, I got it. You know? I was listening to the one you did for Virgo. And, you know, obviously there's this, this is Virgo record with, um, oh, with yeah, Nas nice. yeah. and Dougie Fresh and Ludacris, who yeah. are all Virgos. So when I put it on, I remember putting it on thinking he's definitely going to play that Virgo record. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you yeah. know, you got to play that one. But the way in which you did it, the, the story in which you told going from a certain Nas record to, to the point where he's referencing something in a Dougie Fresh record, then you go to the Lottie Dottie record, then yeah. you bring, bring it to the Virgo record, yeah. then you reference lyrically something and something else. And then by the end of the tape, you're like, we're going backwards in time. Like, I guess you played a Ray Charles record maybe yeah. in there. Yeah. And you know what's crazy about the, the Nas one is the representative yeah. Sample was a guy named Lee Irwin, who's also... See, is that shit? Is that wow. shit? <laughs> so I finished 24 of those mixes, two seasons, mm -hmm. and me and Meth were on a television show called we'll Drop the Mic, where celebrities would jokingly rap battle against each other. It was mm -hmm. a comedy show. And I told Meth, I'm like, yo, man, That's I honored the James, you. Um, Corden. James Corden. Yeah. James Corden had a couple bars for Meth, yeah. but Meth came back and ethered him. So at any rate, I asked Meth. I was we like, just "Yo, didn't know. yeah." I was, like, I was like, "Yo, I got these this series. I honored you on mm -hmm. uh, season one, or whatever. I want to make a song called Zodiac Killer." And he's like, "You got a beat for it?" And I put headphones on his head because we had to be quiet on set and all that. Mm -hmm. And then I see him do like the meth dance. I, I can't do the dance. The meth dance? Yeah, he, he has this like swag. Like he, in all his videos, he has like this swag. And I'm like, I think this is a good sign. Like, <laughs> and then he's like, "Yo, I'm right into this." And I'm like, "Dope." Next week he goes, "Yo." Can we record it today? I was like, yo, this is insane. Replace samples mm -hmm. on that joint. This was the most memorable studio session of my entire career. The dude comes in, grabs the right set of headphones. I have four set up, turns up the right knob, puts the headphones on, and goes, just says, let's go. Not like, you know how it is. You, you get in a s studio with a producer or whatever. You like talk, you know, like, how's your day, blah, blah, blah. I might smoke something. You, you, you kind of warm up to the environment. No, I'm like meth. Really? That's, yeah, I'm like, let's Okay, go. so I'm new to that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm used to like, okay, with J5, I'm used to like, man, I tried to cash this check and, you know, all, all this shit. I'm used to that. And I'm used to being the psychologist too, you know? I'm used to being the psychologist, right. getting everybody in the mood, you right, know, right. warming up. I got a little candle here. I'm used to being that right, dude. Right, right, right. Not him. He was cheat up, ready to go. And it was so funny to me because I was ready too. I had the session up, mm -hmm. record button lit, all that, but my cameraman wasn't. Mm. Shouts to C. Brown. He was the cameraman. Dope DJ. And I just hear him zipping his bag at lightning speed. I'm opening his bag and I'm just dying. I'm like, see, you're going to make me fucking fall <laughs> off this damn chair. He had me laugh as hard and he got it up and one take. This cat knocks his shit out. Mm -hmm. We fixed like a pee pop on the mic. Mm -hmm. That was it. I'm like, yeah. Just kind of looking at it, like perplexed. It had never happened to me. I, I don't think I've ever had a one take in my studio. I've had close. Yeah, one takes, are, that's hard. I don't often get one takes. It's a once in a blue moon, I, I knock it out on one take, but that's, that's, that's a just, tough one. Man, there's always something in the environment that gets in the way. You know, your voice cracks, you mess mm -hmm. up a word. I mean, we're human. Nothing. And I'm like, uh... But Meth is the type of MC where once he heard that beat and you sent him the beat, probably, he's been going over that verse since you sent him that beat, and it's burning a hole in his head. So that's why he's like, can I do it now? The reason he was able to do that is because he's been... 
he can't think about any other rhymes until he gets that out. Mm. T, I don't know what it was, but I just remember saying to him, man, if I spent more time with MCs like you, I would have had a lot more shit finished. Well, come on, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> let's That's go. What we're doing. <laughs> let's go. It was insane. Mm. I, and I said to him, I said, yo, and I told him, I said, man, I've never been in this position before. I said, hey, what do you want to do? I said, I can play you some beats. He's like, I'd love to hear some beats. I played him a bunch of beats. He loved the beats I played him. He's like, damn new. I literally just finished mastering. And I was like, oh, of course. You know, right, right. It, was a, it was a bad time, but it was a good time. So, no, like, but the I, most memorable session. What I like to do is I like to, I like to, at this point, I like to get up with my engineer, Federico. You know Federico, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get up for Fed, Fed in the morning and knock out vocals. But that's what I'll do. Like, I'll call him on the way to the studio and I'll be like, I'll be, I'll be, I'll text him the beat. Yeah. Have this beat up. Yep. I'll call him. I'll be like, listen, I'm, I'm two minutes out. Yeah. Is the mic set up? Because it's so it's fresh in my mind. That's I want to be able to walk in there, lay it, right? Because here's the thing. I also smoke weed. Yeah. So, I try not to smoke until the work is done. So I'm just, I want to get to that yeah. first joint. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm just like, yo, so have that get shit ready. Joint. And so in my head, it's like a reward. Yeah, that's how I am with wine. Yeah. That's how I am with wine. It's like, and okay. And so I smoke the joint. And then yeah. what I do is, after we after we do that a couple of times, that the vibe, the setting up the candle and all that type of stuff, I'll do that for the people later at night. Yeah. So after I get the work done in the morning, maybe take a nap, then yeah. I'll do a, a, a session where I'll bring everybody in and create that vibe mm. and sort of get the feedback and feel it out in the room. And then if I after that, if I feel like I need to re-record or change yeah. something yeah. or add some ad libs, I'll do that. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a great way to work. But. I had never seen anything like it in my life, and yeah. I was just like very appreciative that he came that prepared. Because I've been in op I've been in situations where I've flown to New York and worked mm. with somebody, and they didn't have anything, mm. and they were literally freestyling on the mic. I was like, God damn, what am I gonna do with this? Like, <laughs> you know, like I've had to like stitch and construct and sew and. Uh, what, what did Coogee Rap say? My passion for rhyming is fashion design. And like, I was just stitching away. Like, okay, right. let me, I can piece this with this. I've had to do some crazy shit. Like, well, that's why you, you. So let's um, talk about this Death Fakers rumor. De death Fakers. I don't know if Death Fakers. Death Fakers is the idea that Jurassic 5 is made oh, up God. of I just a talked about this Death Fakers. I, was, I just got off the phone <laughs> with Supernet. Oh, okay. This morning. Okay. I forgot to tell him I was coming here. You would have been fucking... Oh, super nice. Yeah. And yeah. sat at this table and we had a great time. Yeah. Um, he told me some crazy shit this morning. This is crazy, man. You All really... Right, so, so it started with years ago yeah. that Akil is really Tupac. <laughs> and from correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, people accost this man when he's out in the street. Oh, I don't know if they've if they've accosted poor Ock. I hope not. I, this is what I've heard. I've uh, heard I hope that. Not. I, I've definitely I definitely know that they uh, uh, attack him online. I know that they be online like you're like he'll make a post and they'll be like, "Get Man. the fuck out of here! You're Tupac. Stop lying to us." Ugh. Right? And I've heard that people have come up to him in airports or certain places and been like, "You're Tupac," right? But then it. Continue. Uh, you just hurt my soul, man. No, it that, keeps that. going. So apparently, Charlie Tuna is Yaki Gaddafi. Uh, Soup is Biggie. <laughs> oh, uh, God. Mark is Easy E. Oh, please. And you are MCA or Johnny J. <laughs> so, so, so in this, in this, on the official J Five. Wait, wait, hold that thought though. Uh -huh. So Nat told me this morning that they said I was Vlad, yo. That you're Vlad, Vlad from Vlad TV. Yeah, I'm like, but he's uh, alive. Yeah, uh, so, didn't, so none of that made any sense. I'm like, <laughs> so Vlad's a robot, and he's the real Vlad, right there. But wait, how fucked up? Damn, like, so but people want to be you online, and then they want you to be somebody else online too. Like, we're in the strangest. On the J5, on the Jurassic Five verified Instagram account, there's a message. Yeah, I don't know what that is, yeah. but uh, there's a message that says that group members are getting death threats and. Oh, that they're asking people to not ignore this, and they're asking their fans to speak out when they see this happening. Really? Like it's become well, this, well, like an official statement has been made. Yeah, so that was our kill. So he, he controls, you well, know. He's he, the he one does, that gets the brunt he of does, it. He does most of the posting on the sites. Okay, well, um, he's definitely the one that gets the brunt of yeah, it. Yeah, I feel bad that he's going through. I didn't know he was going through that. Like that that's thing. actually hurting my heart because, you know, Honestly, these people need to go to CVS because they have a 50% sale on Q-tips and they should go clean their fucking ears out. I mean, mm -hmm. you can hear the difference between the timbre of Akil's voice mm -hmm. and Tupac. I mean, well, I mean, difference. if you're trying to convince me that this is a ridiculous thing, you're yeah. preaching to the choir. Yeah, no, like, I know. It's, I'm, I'm, it's ridiculous. I'm just kind of perplexed <laughs> that it's gone this far. Like, um, yeah. I don't know even what to say, man. Like, <laughs> like what do you... like? I don't even know what to say. Like, it's weird. You right? know what kind of sucks though about it is like it kind of 
takes away the legitimacy of how hard we worked as a group to mm -hmm. do what we did. That's the only part that I kind of have feelings about. Like, yeah. yo, no, we, we actually worked our asses no, off. No, a kill is actually a kill. Yeah, and, and we were on Interscope, on Interscope, and we were like having to not compete because I didn't even a word, but we were label mates with 50 and Dre and mm -hmm. Eminem, and we had to really work our way to the stage shows. It, we, we had nothing handed to us, that's for damn sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so that part stings a little bit mm -hmm. for me. Uh, the other part that bothers me is, of course, that Ock is going that through this. Anybody could be in yeah, any type of it's like, harm mm -hmm. or distress over this. I think people are very visual, naturally, and they need to start using their ears. If you know, that's what this is telling me. Yeah. If anything, it shows that you guys work very hard that Keel had two different careers. <laughs> wow. If, yeah, man. <laughs> and, like, it would have to be, like, yeah, it would have to be a lot of shit that would have changed. I mean, like. It's a, like the, a, it's the flat earth type of thing. It's like, yeah. it's like this, this, it's something that started on the internet and it's just, it's become accepted truth because I guess, be, and I guess that's the point of, of whoever's running the account is making that, yeah. you know, you know, a, a, a lie can run twice oh. around the world before the truth gets up to tie his shoelaces. Yeah, yeah, you got that right. I Man, I, I wish I had more to say on the topic, bro. No, I mean, I, you know, it's, I'm glad that it's not, I'm glad yeah. that, I mean, I hope that Akil is, is figuring out how to deal with it, but I'm yeah. glad that it's not like bigger than I thought it was. Yeah, um, I, I think maybe, I don't know, part of me is like, don't interact with them. And then the other part's like, yeah, they're fucking with the legacy. And then the other part's like, oh man, I don't know. It's so weird. I'm conflicted. It's, this, we're in a weird time, man. I don't know. It's, that's some strange weird. shit to say. I mean, because Mark 7 don't look nothing like no damn easy E, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> that shit, you just, you just uppercutted me with that one. I was like, <laughs> maybe they need eye surgery too. Shit. Shit, damn. right? Now, you um, have been doing a lot of music with Slim Kid Trey. And yeah. You got a whole project now. Yeah. But the project is like, is it made up of a bunch of stuff? A lot of it is songs that have come out already, right? So, Trey and I bonded again uh, uh libra gemini connection we bonded because he um he, we met and he was just like i'm down for whatever mm -hmm. and i hadn't really heard that from mcs before it was usually you know mcs have the, the shit that they want to do or mm -hmm. even guitar players piano players you know however you're working they have their shit trey was like whatever new i trust you like mm -hmm. completely hands off the wheel and i was like yeah this feels like some far side shit like yeah and so i we did one song together, and we we're like, "Yo, let's 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 do a super group." Next thing I know, I blinked, and we were like five songs deep. And I'm like, "Man, this is starting to sound pretty. It's gelling together." I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, we did a Slim Kid DJ Newmark project, and then we did a follow up to that called Trademark, where we brought in another young a younger MC named Austin Antoine, who's incredible. Mm -hmm. And we just, I don't know, recorded to have fun, like no expectations, just wanted to get some shit off. You know, he was really going through the bout with. Far side, you know. Now they're almost all almost. together. They got they, they got, got one piece. They left. got one piece of the puzzle. Right. Uh, <laughs> but look, you know, going back to like the Method Man thing, you know, we would sit and have the deep conversations. Like, yeah, my group broke up too, and we would have these heavy mm -hmm. conversations. And and some, I guess, it was therapy in some way for us. We needed each other, mm -hmm. and we just recording came out of it. And um, great person, an amazing, amazing hey, human great being. Guy. Yeah. Uh, and I had fun recording, and that's all I could ever ask for in the studio. Right up. Yeah, and um, you know, you have keep stretching, like you stretch the crowd. You keep stretching your your talents, and you've given me, you've gifted me a copy of the Run for Cover. Can we grab that? Yeah. If someone grab that. I want to show that on camera. Yeah, you've done this Run for Cover album, which is which is covers, which is exciting for me as a DJ. Um, immediately, I was drawn to the Passe Cavassier, but you have um, everybody, everybody with uh, the, the <laughs> Bacayo Rhythm and Steel Band yeah. and Passe Cavassier with Full Crate, Ain't No Fun, Hot in Here, Bigger Than Hip Hop, which is a Middle Eastern version, yeah. which I heard you went to the Middle East to yeah. get this done. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you heard Run for Cover. Mm -hmm. It came about from the Canto de Asana thing. Okay. And I did an Imagine cover a few years back, too. And I was like, man, I do well with covers, so I just decided to do a whole project with it. Yeah, the Imagine shit is dope, too. But um, I try to get an MC to rhyme in Farsi uh -huh. Uh -huh. over over is bigger than hip hop and all the all the MCs were fronting on me man <laughs> I did like two months talking to a bunch of different dudes and they just didn't want to I don't know if they if it was like a thing where they didn't want to redo someone else's lyrics mm -hmm. I, I really couldn't tell what it was I couldn't get a beat on it but I'm still yo any Farsi MCs out there I still want to do it please hit me up I did a song with a group that rhymes in Farsi uh, called Sons of Yusef is that Narcy's 
I'm sure they know Narsi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Positive yeah. they do. Well, you got to do the intro, but um, mm -hmm. I'm glad you heard the record. It's all covers. I It's covers flipped into a different genre, basically, was the goal, roughly. Right. And so I flipped past the Cavassier into a Middle Eastern version. You know, Ain't No Fun is like a saxophone kind of cumbia, semi-jazzy thing. You know, there's a bunch of different versions flipped, and um, I'm just happy the DJs are, are rocking it, man. Yes, yes, indeed. What's next for DJ Newmark? I have to, I've been avoiding a project for about 25 to 30 years. It's really? a long time. Um, a, mid like a Middle Strab. Eastern project to pay homage to my family, to my Persian roots. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, I always forget the damn name of the song, but the, the joint, you know, uh, that Jay-Z did, um, that has a Middle Eastern sample in it. The fucking. Right, uh, 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 I always want to say dirt off your shoulders, but it's not dirt off your shoulders. Um, big pimping. Big pimping. Thank you. I, I don't know why I can never get that name, but ever since that song came out, my mom's like, "You need to make some shit like this." <laughs> <laughs> your mom. And let me hey, tell you something. My mom. Is, let me tell you something. That's my, right? my mom knows just, hits. Uh, she. My mom has picked hits from from when I work with Kanye. All the way, like when there was J five songs that weren't popular, she's like, "Nope, that ain't it." She knows oh, what the hits it. were, mm -hmm. and she's like, "You need to do some shit like this." I'm like, "Yeah, you're right, you're right, mom." I'm, and I just that's that belly dance energy. She's like, "I know it works." Yeah, yeah. And she was a belly dancer <laughs> for a while, so she she knew it. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm creating a project um, called Amu Nu, which means Uncle Nu in mm -hmm. Farsi. And um, the cover it is my the cover of it is my grandfather who is Iranian, and it's a two hour long mix. Uh, starting from like 68, 69 to the present times, like, but funky Middle Eastern shit. It starts with funk and then kind of comes up to the, you know, most mm -hmm. greatest, you know, trappiest or hard hitting 808 shit. But it's going to be a coffee table book that's half my recipes, mm. my, my Persian recipes, mm. and the other half, um, all my fr favorite friends, best places to dine. Middle Eastern food all around the world. Wow. And a floppy record with one of my produc productions in the back. So I'm with working. The book, that's a good idea. I'm working hard on that. It's kicking my ass, but it's going to happen. I'm about 80% done. Yeah, that's. I used roughly. to watch Shaws of Sunset, and oh, that yeah. was like, food <laughs> is a huge thing in your culture. Yeah, you show up and there's just a table full of fruit first. And you're yeah. Like, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, so I have my work cut out for me. I got all the recipes done. Mm -hmm. I'm just chipping away at the, the book part now. Yeah. Well, I am honored to be able to live in a world and a time that you are alive in. Man, uh, come on. People's Party is proud to have DJ Newmark in the Man. place to be. My pleasure. <laughs>